Good afternoon and welcome to today's Investor Signals Market Update for January 2015. I wish everyone a happy and prosperous year ahead. Any individual reading or listening should discuss with their financial planner or advisor the merits of any recommendation offer presented in this material from their own specific circumstances and realise that not all investments are appropriate for every individual presented today. Myself, Leon Hine, Managing Director of Investor Signals and the Investment Manager for the Investor Signals Model Portfolio. I have over 17 years of experience in the financial services industry. The topics for today, we look at the macro uh, factors driving global equity markets. We roll through the ASX Top 50 with a particular focus on the 2015 earnings, which which will commence in uh, February approximately, and the dividend yields. Uh, obviously, we have US earnings seasons kicking off tonight and running over the next two or three weeks, so I'll comment on that where necessary as we roll through the top 50 stocks, and we conclude with a portfolio allocation in light of the significant sort of macro shifts in markets, in particular with the energy market and what that means for different sectors, and uh, conclude with a short-term market outlook. The Investor Signal Service is a premium broking account service where we work in partnership with you. We run a model portfolio of ASX 50 stocks. We utilise call options to enhance portfolio returns and reduce volatility. We look at the effective ownership around ex-dividend dates to produce above average cash flow while still providing capital growth. It's all under a strict investment mandate, so suitable for superannuation funds and most importantly the assets remain in your name. If you'd like to know more, please contact me, Leon at investorsignals.com. Moving straight into a graph of the US market at the moment, and uh, look, in general the US economy continues to be the shining light. Um, the most recent data show Friday's US non-farm payroll report uh, concluded that the, the US produced the best year of job growth in over 15 years. The unemployment rate fell to a post-recession low. Um, last month. I suppose one of the negatives that the market focused on within that report, which was responsible, partly responsible for the downturn Friday night, was the wages component uh, that sort of stole the limelight. But generally the revision showed employers added roughly 50,000 more jobs in October and November than that was previously estimated. So now the US employment rate falls down to 5.6 from 5.8. So yeah, that's an important benchmark. Uh, the concern somewhat related to the wage growth, uh, but in general the US economy is continuing to expand. Um, I'll look at a couple of macro uh, charts in a moment. We'll look at the Treasuries, we'll look at gold, we'll look at the Aussie dollar. But just to come back to the graph on screen, the Dow Jones. Now, I spent a lot of time last year working out uh, what the fair value for the Dow Jones was based on the total earnings of the S&P 500 uh, and working backwards from there. And essentially the US market continued to trade for the most part of last year at the top end of what that fair valuation range. Where we sit at the moment as we come into US earnings season, which kicks off tonight, is we're really looking for annualised earnings growth in the US of somewhere around 8%. So quarter on quarter, we're looking for about a 2% increase on the September quarter in average aggregate S&P 500 earnings. So if that happens, uh, arguably at about 18 times earnings, the Dow Jones is about fair value. If for any reason we don't get that sort of annualised growth rate of 8%, then I think sort of applying a slightly lower multiple sort of gets you down to sort of this lower sort of 16, 16 and a half thousand. But I think you know, all things being equal, the US stocks are not particularly expensive and they can continue to support this current price range uh, you know, even in an environment where probably US earnings don't grow quite as quickly as anticipated. And what we're seeing, and I think this is a really important macro picture to have a look at, which I'll bring into screen next, which is the 10-year treasuries in the US. So throughout 2014, I spoke about um, if this concern that uh, the Fed is going to need to tighten US rates in 2015 is a reality, what we'd expect to see is the bond market starting to price that in. And there's absolutely no evidence at the moment that the bond market is suggesting that the Fed's going to move to begin tightening rates in the US. We can continue to see the downward pressure on yields here, and this is the 10-year treasuries. Um, and this sort of feeds into this picture as to, uh, you know, look, most commodities have fallen over the last couple of years. Oil's probably, arguably gold was the first commodity to begin falling. Oil's probably the last. Um, 
the thinking at the moment is that maybe gold's the first to recover and eventually oil will be the last to recover. I'm not sure about that second part of the equation, but there's definitely evidence there that gold's recovering, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the 10-year Treasury's falling. The concern here is that this leads into this deflation picture. So some people believe oil's falling because of the lack of global growth and lack of confidence, which partly feeds into the deflation picture. Others obviously form a view that it's an oversupply issue, but again, are supported by the fact of a, of a lack of growth in demand. Um, regardless, the point that I probably draw your attention to here is again, throughout 2015, we'll revisit these uh, yields or the treasuries here in the US and look at the 10-year graph as our reference point. Ultimately, we would like to see this actually beginning to find support and trend higher. So whilst obviously low interest rates are good for everyone, uh, and we've seen sort of quantitative easing and the various things that have gone on to, to help stimulate the economy, and we're seeing Europe and, and Japan having to chip in and do their bit over the next sort of 12 to 24 months. But ultimately, we want to see these US yields stabilise and gradually start to begin trending a little bit higher. Otherwise, the concern is that the deflationary picture is winning out, uh, which, which has uh, more significant implications, which if needed, we'll revisit throughout 2015 as we go through the recordings. All right, so moving on from that, let's have a quick look at gold, what's happening here. At around 1100 now, it's always sort of thought that gold was probably good value and ready for a bounce. It's hard to determine how much higher it goes. I always thought maybe from 1100 a rally back to around 1400 an ounce was on the cards. What's uh, driving this current rally at the moment is the fact that this probability that US rates rise sooner rather than later in the US is probably there's no evidence to support that and we just looked at that in the bond market. So if interest rates in the US don't move higher, the uh, gold probably you know, can do better in that environment. So we might get a period of three or six months where gold rallies whilst we wait to see a, a stronger global economic pic picture develop, which I think will only happen if obviously we get the right policy action from the ECB Japan and we see improvement in China. Um, all right, so moving on from gold, we'll revisit that when we get to Newcrest. Quick look at the Aussie dollar. So uh, part of this picture is we're seeing this sort of US dollar pullback after the strength in the US dollar. Um, this all culminates around these issues of the, the reduced probability of interest rates rising in the US sooner rather than later. If that's the case, the US dollar remains a little bit weaker. It's providing an environment for the Aussie dollar to rebound a little bit, which has implications for your Westfields, your Amcors, your Brambles. So again, we'll revisit that as we go through the top 50 stocks. Okay, moving straight into the Australian market graph of the XJO at about 15 times forward earnings. Uh, our companies will begin their earnings releases in February. Uh, our market's trading on just over a 4% dividend yield. Uh, we've seen a lot of disparity develop between sort of the US dollar earners and uh, the other end of the extreme, the Australian resource stocks for uh, healthcare trading, you know, 25 times earnings, industrials trading 20 times earnings, resources trading 10 times earnings. So I'll chat a little bit about that as we move through this, the, uh, the the top 50 stocks. But broadly, I don't think this picture changes. I think the Australian market finds support at around 5,100, starts to get expensive up at 55, 5,600, and I think we still sort of run that as a strategy over the next three months. Uh, all right, moving into the first stock, AGK, uh, AGL it is now. Um, look, to put some numbers on this, the stock trades on about a 13.5% dividend yield, about 14, uh, 13.5, I should say it trades on a 14 times PE on a 4.5% dividend yield. The market's looking for pretty flat earnings growth from 13 to 14 when they report in February. I think AGL could surprise slightly to the upside. At $14, I think it's an opportunity to sell 1450 covered calls. So we'll revisit that uh, when we start to look to sell those covered calls over AGL. 
Now, we'll try to script, skip through these reasonably quickly. Uh, Asiano, somewhat uh, trading about 15 times earnings on a 3% dividend yield. I'd highlighted around 550 was value. I really struggle to sort of make the uh, leap of faith here with Asiano. I think there's other stocks in the market that provide better value. Amcor, watching this closely as the stock pulls back, look, it's 20 times 2015 earnings. It's only on a 3.5% dividend yield, so it really started to get pretty expensive up here. If we were to see a pullback anywhere down to around 12.50, and this might be driven by the fact that if the Aussie dollar has a bit of short covering and it rallies a little bit higher, we might see a bit of downward pressure on Amcor. I think it's a buying opportunity, so we watch that closely in the months ahead or even weeks ahead. Uh, Amcor should deliver about 10 to 12 percent earnings growth, so we'll watch that result in February. AMP not doing too much here, trading on about 15 times earnings and about a 4 percent dividend yield, looking for about 10 percent earnings growth. Review that in February off the back of the earnings result. ANZ trading 12 times on about a 5.5 percent dividend yield. I think underlying bank earnings probably somewhere between 3 to 5 percent. Um, ANZ not our preferred bank at present. Uh, not doing anything there at APA. ASX, now look, I'll pause and spend a bit of time on this name. The stock should deliver earnings per share of around $2.205, which is up about 5% on the same time last year. The dividends per share should be up around about $1.85 for the whole year. Puts the stock on a 5% dividend yield and 18 times earnings. I think at these levels, it's probably, you know, getting to a stage where it's worth selling covered calls up at around $38, collect that call premium, collect the dividend. I'll just highlight that I think over the next 12 months there's a high probability that ASX is subject to another takeover. So it's an interesting name to add to portfolios. I think it provides some downside protection relative to other assets within the top 50. AZJ, I like this name, minor beneficiary of lower oil prices. The company's buying back 100 million uh, shares on issue. 16 times earnings, over a 4% dividend yield. It's a definite buy on the dip for us, but I don't see a huge amount of upside short term, so we want to be selling covered calls to drive the extra cash flow out of AZJ. BHP, um, the, the real story here with these commodity names, and we're not going to know the full detail until we see the February results, but obviously they're cutting their capital expenditure, they're increasing production, um, and that's helping them to achieve similar margins. I think we'll probably see something in the order of 10, maybe a maximum of 15% fall in earnings. Obviously, uh, it, it, we're going to watch these results in February with a great deal of interest. Um, brambles. I should just add to that, BHP still remains our preferred resource exposure. Bramble's trading at 24 times earnings, 2.5% dividend yield makes it expensive. It is probably due for earnings upgrades off the back of the, the lower Aussie dollar, so most analysts have factored in Aussie dollar somewhere around 87, so at 80 or 82 expect further earnings upgrade, but the underlying company's growing earnings about 6%, um, but either way, no matter how you cut it, it's expensive, so if we want to own it at these levels, you have to be selling the covered calls. CBA, uh, look, coming into the dividend, uh, well, total dividends for 2015 should be around $4.20. Uh, the stock's expensive, back under a 5% dividend yield at the moment, but no doubt it's the best bank along with Westpac in the Australian banking sector at present. Coca-Cola, now I don't think they're going to deliver anything in the way of earnings growth for 2015. The only thing that could be a surprise in the earnings result in February will be their forward guidance. Um, however, there's structural problems the company's dealing with. They're obviously reducing capital expenditure. They're cutting staff, restructuring where possible, looking at new product initiatives, marketing initiatives. We're seeing the parent company heavily invest in their Indonesian bottling business. All that being said, let's assume earnings stay flat for another 12 months. The stock's on a 5% dividend yield. Uh, I think gradually the trend's changing. I'd expect over a two to three year period Coca-Cola to continue with its recovery, but we own it, we sell the covered calls, we collect the upcoming 20 cent dividend, we collect the 30 cents for the call options, generating about 50 cents worth of cash flow out of Coca-Cola for the next six months. Computer share, I've mentioned at around $11.50, this was probably starting to look like okay value um, relative you know, to some other areas of the market, but um, I, 
I also uh, highlighted that around $13, $13.50, I didn't see the upside potential for the stock beyond that. So to the extent that we own it here, I think you need to be selling covered calls at around this $13 level to drive the extra cash flow and income. I think it bounces sideways. It's an obvious beneficiary, beneficiary of the lower Aussie dollar. Um, however, the last earnings result or the outlook in particular, the company lowered sort of markets expectations and said, look, we'll, we'll be lucky to grow earnings at 5%. So I don't think we've got any reason at this stage to think that the February result, other than the support from the currency, is really going to surprise any, is going to deliver any surprises. CSL, 27 times earnings, 1%, 1.5% dividend yield. Good 10 to 12 percent underlying earnings growth. The company's buying back more shares, but no matter which way you cut it, it's getting expensive. Need to be selling covered calls over it. Crown. Um I'll spend more time on Crown in the February report. I think the stock's probably okay value down here, but they're obviously having to deal with a number of issues uh, in their Macau operation, considering issues in, in Perth um, and also high capital expenditure over the next coming years weighing on investor confidence but uh, I still suspect they deliver 10% earnings growth if not a little bit more the stocks on a three and a bit percent dividend yield I think it's okay value here Fortescue and we'll revisit that in February Goodman Group still one of the great property stocks on the ASX top 50 but very expensive, 16 times earnings on a 3.7% dividend yield. So expensive for these property names. GPT probably slightly more attractive, just paid its dividend at the end of December. Uh, we own this name. Uh, throughout the course of 2015, it should pay a total of around 23 cents of dividends. It's on a 5% uh, yield. Um, which certainly makes it a little bit more attractive than Goodman Group. Also, we can sell covered calls over GPT, so we can boost that cash flow from 5% to around 10%, but certainly welcome the opportunity to buy GPT on a pullback. Now, IAG, there's not many names that we've been buyers of. IAG's been one of them, so I'm pleased to say that whilst the rest of the market struggled, we picked up IAG on its lows here. The stock's rallying now. We're selling calls out into the 675 level into June. We'll collect the upcoming dividend plus the call option um, and allow for some capital growth. So I think that's a fairly defensive. And the whole logic here of rotating into IAG was that we saw that a lot of the other areas of the market were just getting too expensive. And... Um, on a six percent, five or six percent dividend yield, uh, with five to ten percent earnings growth on a relative basis, uh, and the Aussie dollar story pretty much running its course, uh, we didn't see a reason to chase those names, and we started to shift capital into a, into a couple of names that we maybe had not have been active in in 2014. But so we own IAG here. We're letting it rally. Uh, with effective exit price just up over seven dollars, and collecting the upcoming dividend. Aluka not doing there at the moment. IPL, look, I'm pleased to say this one has played out as expected. Uh, we were bullish on this in 2014, looking for much stronger performance into the latter part of 14 and into 15. That's starting to play out. We're seeing you know tailwinds come from the lower Aussie dollar, stronger DAP prices. Um, I think IPL, as I've spoken about, the 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 production that's coming out of the Maramba plant, the investment that they have uh, in, I think, uh, Louisiana uh, in the US uh, will continue to underpin IPL's earnings. I think we could see double-digit earnings growth across the next three years for IPL. Um, right at the moment, the stock's pretty full value, though. Even with those earnings upgrades for 15, the stock trades about 15 times earnings, a 3.5% dividend yield. We've taken the opportunity to give ourselves a little bit of downside protection where we've sold the $3.30 calls out into May. We got $0.30 cents for those, so we're effectively selling the stock at $3.60. Uh, the stock will pay a dividend in March, in May, I should say. Uh, if we end up having to deliver the stock at $3.60, it's a reasonable outcome. We'll get an opportunity to buy in at a lower price, I think. Um, James Hardy, not being there at present, we'll revisit that in February's recording. Likewise with Lendlease, the stock's expensive, 3% dividend yield, that even allows for 10% earnings growth. So we'll continue to watch it closely. It's a quality business. We want to keep exposure to Lendlease, but ideally buy it on a dip. Uh, 
Macquarie Group, look, just to touch on here, the market's already pricing in 20% earnings growth, puts it on a 5% dividend yield. I think we see consolidation, hard to see the company outperforming that 20% earnings growth that the market's already priced in. Uh, NAB put some numbers on this, about a 6% dividend yield, so a little bit higher than the other banks. Um, look, I haven't chatted too much about technical indicators in today's recording, but interesting that NAB, albeit I wouldn't say an aggressive downtrend, it's still making slightly lower lows, slightly lower highs uh, and we've got sort of one of the few signals that are coming in here at the moment, which is I probably just take that as a little bit of a warning just to watch, but uh, not too concerned there around the downside risk to NAB. Uh, Newcrest, pleased to say the rally's finally underway, the breakout's happening, hopefully we see a push much higher. Um, <clears throat> It's quite possible when Newcrest reports their results in February that the market might be pleasantly surprised uh, as to the discipline that Newcrest has put in place on the cost control uh, and, the, and the benefits they've received from a lower Aussie dollar. Uh, and obviously we've seen, uh, we may see more details from the company around the additional um, uh, deposits that the company announced at the late, the, the latter part of last year. So hopefully this has a little bit further to run uh, and we'll revisit sort of where the right point to sell covered calls uh, over Newcrest, uh, you know, a, as this uh, breakout unfolds. But again, a very interesting result to take a look at in February, so we'll pull that apart more then. Uh, Origin, so these oil and gas names obviously under pressure, we've seen oil barely bounce from the $50 range. Uh, it's hard to really get a handle on what these numbers mean for the business. Um, roughly from what I can understand, Santos with spot oil where it is, maybe fair valuations $9, Origin maybe fair values around $12.50, um, but there's a lot of uh, uh, unease among shareholders and uh, uh, and really until we sort of see the commentary out of the companies post uh, the upcoming earnings season, I think it's pretty hard to read too much in. I think it's probably worth being fairly aggressive with covered calls over these energy names uh, at or near those levels that I just mentioned uh, as a way of sort of hedging some downside and driving some extra cash flow. Uh, I reckon not doing there at the moment. Oil search, same applies here. Probably fair value is around $7 for oil search. Um, I would be fairly aggressive in selling covered calls around the $8 level regardless of the cost base on oil search. QBE not doing it there at present. Ramsey, expensive, uh, but obviously a quality name, but it's had a good run, not doing there at present at the moment. Uh, Rio, even in light of lower iron ore prices, we've seen the company come out at the end of 2014 and announce that over the next five years they're going to be buying back 10% of the equity on issue. Obviously that'll help earnings per share. Uh, the company's commented on the strong up a pick, uh, um, pick up in production. So again, we watch with a great deal of interest the BHP and Rio result, results to see what this cutting capital expenditure, the pick up in production, uh, what it actually means to their earnings year on year um, from 14 to 15. Uh, SCG, I think getting expensive up here, uh, trading back down around a 5% dividend yield. Um, we're happy to take a look at that on a pullback, but our preference probably still remains GPT. Likewise with uh, Stocklands, it paid its dividend uh, roughly 12 cents at the end of December. The stock price is holding up well, but fairly full value at these levels. Uh, to the extent that we look to buy back into Stocklands, I would again complement it with a fairly tight covered call as I think it largely trades sideways over the next six months. Uh, Sonic, so we own this at lower levels. We saw the company downgrade their earnings outlook. The market was looking for sort of 5 to 7%. The company's come through and down graded that to 2%, that was responsible for this sell-off here. But given the defensive nature of its earnings, uh, <coughs> we've seen the price rally back, uh, partly off the back of the lower Aussie dollar. I think where we sit at the moment, the stock's on about 18 times earnings, a 4% dividend yield. Uh, what we've done just recently is at the top of this rally, taken the opportunity to sell the $19 calls 
So that brings the cash flow up to around 10% per annum from the dividend and the call option, gives us some downside protection. But I think through, throughout the bulk of 2015, uh, Sonic trade sideways, but probably, if anything, pushing up against the top end of that uh, range that I just mentioned there. Uh, Santos, I spoke a, a bit about this, really, with spot prices where they are, the stock's worth about $9 at best. Um, the positive you can look at there is that ANZ's obviously provided the company a billion-dollar lending facility at the end of last year, so management suggests that they're not going to need to tap uh, shareholders or the market for uh, the issue of new equity. Um, but also on the flip side, the negative is obviously where spot oil prices are. The argument is Santos isn't making much on the margin. They are likely to be the first one to ship gas from Curtis Island. Um, and one would assume that there's some residual value there that maybe other competitors may be starting to look at in the Santos business. But we keep an eye on this very closely in light of the volatility that is occurring in the oil market at present. Uh, Suncorp, so this is the other name that we've switched to after ignoring it throughout the most part of 2014. Like IAG, we've moved back into Suncorp on the basis that it provides a 6.5% dividend yield, still delivering about 8 to 10% earnings growth. Um, so on a relative basis and trading at a, a reasonably low P of about 13 times earnings. So we own it at lower levels and we're just looking to start selling the covered calls up at around $14.00. 70. We'll collect the upcoming dividend of around 40 cents. Uh, so again, on the basis that it moves sideways, but we think it provides lower volatility as an exposure to portfolio to some of the other names. Sydney Airports continues to perform well, 5% dividend yield. Uh, Transurban likewise, so with the Australian bond yields pricing in the probability of an interest rate cut in the six months ahead, we're seeing these defensive names perform well. Uh, Transurban's no exception, but it's down on a 4.3% dividend yield at the moment. And again, I'd, I'd think pushing up against the top end of its valuation range. So in an environment where Australian interest rates uh, are already priced into maybe four quarter of a basis point in the next six months, um, again, if we move into buying these names, uh, I would certainly encourage you to look at selling the covered call as a way of enhancing the cash flow from them, as ultimately there will be a period where they consolidate and move sideways in the environment where you're really looking at just the underlying growth of the business and not the assistance from a, a falling interest rate that has not already been priced in. Telstra at these levels, 5% dividend yield. Uh, we're seeing the company renegotiate their MBN arrangement with the government. Uh, that outcome of that's not entirely clear at the moment, but I think we can be pretty comfortable it won't be uh, a worse result than what investors had already priced in or assumed for Telstra. So we've got the dividend yield probably tracking at around 33 cents a share in 2015, moving up to 34 cents a share in 2016. So therefore, even with sort of earning somewhere around th growth around 3 to 5 percent, um, I think the stock remains attractive and any opportunity to buy in on a pullback, we're going to be aggressive. But even if capital's available, buying in at these levels, collecting the upcoming dividend and selling a covered call continues to make sense for Telstra. Toll Holdings been a beneficiary of lower oil prices. To put some numbers on this, the stock trades at 14 and a half times earnings and about a 5% dividend yield. I think at around $6 a stock gets expensive. We know from an operational standpoint the company highlighted that they're not expecting much in the way of earnings growth when they report their results. So the only tailwind is going to be the lower oil prices. I think maybe the market's already uh, more than allowed for that with it trading where it is at the moment. So it will pay around, around 42 cents of earnings per share of which they'll pay out about 30 cents of dividends in 2015. So where we own it at lower levels, we've sold the covered calls and effectively giving up gain above $6 and I think that probably sits about right there for toll. But if oil prices stay low, I think toll becomes a name that comes back onto the radar uh, as an allocation for portfolios in 2015. Uh, Westpac, uh, three, 13 times earnings, 5.5% dividend yield. That and CBA are our preferred banking exposure. Wes Farmers, now this is interesting to put some numbers on this, 20 times earnings opposed to Woolworths now trading back at 14, 15 times earnings. 
uh, West Farm is on a uh, 5.5% dividend yield, so we own it at lower levels, but we're looking to sell the covered calls, as has been the case. Interesting when you look at West Farm is really, if we go back to, um, what, say, the beginning of February 2013, so really across the last two years, Wes Farmers hasn't changed in price albeit there's been periods of volatility. I think maybe the next six months is really just more of the same for Wes Farmers. Uh, WFD been a big beneficiary of the lower Aussie dollar and the market getting more excited about potential earnings upgrades coming through for Westfield. I think probably it's seen its best days for this rally. We watch it closely, any pullback on this strength in the Aussie dollar. If we had an opportunity to buy back into Westfield at maybe $8.75, uh, we'd be jumping all over that. So we'll keep an eye on that in the weeks ahead. Uh, Wally's not doing it there at present. Woolworths I touched on. So if you, know, if you haven't been reading the papers, you know the, what's been responsible for this sell-off in Woolworths is to keep it really simple, the company had guided between 4 to 7 percent earnings growth. They've come out and said they'll be lucky to deliver 2 percent earnings growth. Even on that basis, the company delivers $2 of, of earnings per share, $1.45 of dividends, puts it on almost a 5 percent dividend yield. I think the stock's okay value here. I think it could rally back up to around 31.50 at that point take the opportunity to sell the covered calls, collect the upcoming dividend, collect the call premium. I think two, 2015 will be a slow year for Woolworths. So for people, for investors holding Woolworths, I really think it's, you need to be sensible about where we set that call level, drive the extra cash flow, but ultimately over a two or three year period, Woolworths is going to recover and be trading higher than where it is today. Uh, Woodside Petroleum, that's another one that we'll look at closely in the earnings results when they come out, but within the oil and gas space, we've gravitated towards the best balance sheet, Woodside's the place to be. And uh, as I've mentioned here with the index, I think you're know, largely tracking sideways. And then back to AGK. Uh, so thank you for listening into today's recording. And again, just to conclude with sort of where we see the market heading, in light of the fact that the US market's coming into earnings season, there's going to be some volatility. Uh, it'll be a fascinating report in February as, re as we review the US earnings results and start to look at the beginning of the Australian earnings result. I think really the US market probably more than likely tracks sideways for the next six months, as does our market. Uh, we're waiting in anticipation to see the strength of the stimulus program that comes out of the ECB. Uh, and with any luck, 2015 uh, brings with it slightly better data out of China, which will help to underpin uh, global equity markets and uh, provide uh, you know, a floor for equity valuations to sort of consolidate and, and later move sideways uh, should we start to see a synchronised sort of global GDP uh, that everyone's looking for. Thank you for listening in and I look forward to speaking next month.